So all around us, in our homes, in our cars, and in the palm of our hands, products are getting smarter. Not only do they look more beautiful, but they respond increasingly to our touch, to the sound of our voice, and adapt to our needs. They are flexible, they're intelligent, and they're responsive. The same, unfortunately, cannot be said about the factories that make these smart products. Now, I don't know if you've had a chance to recently visit a factory, but it's like getting in a time machine and going back 30 years. I had an opportunity to visit factories all over the world, and whether it was Milpitas, USA, or Mexico, the thing that struck me as I walked into a factory was just how analog everything was. There were you know, literally thousands of people working on machines, noisy machines everywhere, and many of them were doing the same task over and over and over again. I mean, it's a little strange to see, let alone believe, that someone in this day and age is standing at the end of a line inserting a fastener hundreds of times, if not thousands of times a day. And those are the factories that build these smart products. Now, if this was just a matter of aesthetics, that would be one thing, you know. Yeah, your factory should look modern and clean and all those kinds of things. But this analog-centric approach, this labor-centric, huge numbers of paper flying around the factory, that approach has led to some real systemic challenges in manufacturing today. I'll name three. First, to begin with, the utilization in a factory, a modern factory, is low. Somewhere in the neighborhood of about 40%. These machines sit idle more than half the time waiting on an operator, waiting on materials. Problem number one. Problem number two, quality continues to be an issue. So there are scrap rates in these modern factories of somewhere between 2 to 5%. And that doesn't sound like a high number, but when you think about the value of the components that they're assembling into a mobile phone or a network device, they run in the millions of dollars. So these small percentages add up to a large economic impact to the bottom line. But perhaps most pressingly, the third issue that is plaguing factories today is labor turnover. So in one factory that I visited in China, the customer told me that their turnover was 30%. This is a factory that employed 53,000 people. So that customer was hiring every month, every month, 10,000 people just to keep up with the current level of demand. 10,000 people that needed to be hired, that needed to be trained, that needed to get good at their jobs, only to leave six, nine months later. So labor turnover is a real issue in factories today. So you combine these three things, and this starts to be a pretty nasty problem for people to solve, but it's getting exacerbated now because it's coming at a time when demand for these smart products is on the rise. We have a rising middle class around the world. People need more and more of smart medical devices. They need better network connectivity. They need smarter transportation solutions. So they need more and more of these smart products. And the combination of those endemic problems and rising demand is making trying to solve this problem increasingly of manufacturing capacity a big challenge for manufacturers around the world. Add to that, there's a capability demand being placed on them now. People want products built much more in a customized fashion to their taste. So manufacturers are really now starting to struggle with this problem of how do they get and make the next big leap in manufacturing. When globalization was the last big leap they made, it seems to have run its course. They are looking to make the next big leap in manufacturing capability and capacity. 
So the time to reimagine factories is upon us. And I believe that software is central to the reimagination of factories. Because software is key to scaling the thing that adds capacity, capability, the next big leap in manufacturing, and that is automation. I mean, you all have seen pictures of robots and smart machines and things of that nature, and you probably think that, well, you know, aren't people automating already? The sad truth is automation today is hard to scale. It costs too much, takes too long, it really isn't flexible. It relies on a small number of highly skilled people putting these automation machines in places in factories. And that's why when you think of those pictures of robots and smart machines, you typically see them in high capital investment projects. In automotive, where they're welding panels or they're painting car bodies, you don't see them making a coffee maker. You don't see them making a medical device. You don't see them assembling your mobile phone. And that's because the faster cycle time there are in products and the shorter time they have to deploy automation, the less possible it is for people to scale automation to multiple products and different products around the world. So automation today, the sad truth is automation itself is not automated. It requires a lot of expertise and manual intervention to make auto or automation work. And this is where software comes in. Because software is key to scaling automation. It replaces that whole you know, art-oriented way of configuring automation. And by creating a software layer that connects these smart machines, these robots, and arms them through AI with eyes and brains, it makes it possible to scale automation, to deploy it quickly, to configure automation around the world, and deploy it in a much more economical way. And this whole process of having software, intelligent software, that configures, monitors, manages smart machinery, and responds in real time to changes, whether they are quality issues that crop up on the production line, or customer changes that are being foisted upon the product, that approaches what we call software-defined manufacturing. Software literally defining the process that gets executed on these production lines. Now, software-defined manufacturing, at the heart of that, is AI. So I'm not just here at COGX to speak to you about software being applied to factories. It's really the fact that AI makes it possible to solve two really difficult problems in automating automation. So first, by providing computer vision, machine learning, and adaptive robotics, we can go after problems where automation has not really been applied. And I'm going to speak to one of these uh, in a moment, and that is the whole problem of assembly which is actually putting products together, taking all the components, and assembling them into finished product. That's been hard to do, because that's where humans are relied on to handle all of the variation, all of the dexterity required in assembling products. That's where those thousands and thousands of people that I talk about are typically found, is, is in assembling products, not making the individual parts. And finally, through AI, through computer vision, through smart adaptive robotics, we can go after that problem. So that's the first thing AI does for us in this world of software-defined manufacturing. The second thing AI lets us do is turn data into intelligence. Because while we can attack the assembly problem through adaptive robotics, there's much more that can be done when you connect all of the machines that are involved in the production process and treat it like a single system so when you discover an issue at machine number eight, you can trace it all the way back that the issue may have started on machine number two and change a configuration setting to improve the performance of that entire production line. So by looking at this problem as a data-first problem, looking at production and manufacturing as a data-first problem, 
AI lets us run these production lines intelligently, autonomously, much like you read about autonomous driving today. This is what enables autonomous manufacturing. So let me talk about those two things in turn, how AI lets us go solve a, a couple set of a uh, couple of these problems. So we're going to start at the back end of these production lines. Now, as a company, we focus to begin with on the electronics product market. I talked about smart products. It's the fastest growing segment of products in the world. It is where labor is becoming increasingly difficult to find, and it is where automation can be brought to bear to to speed up product development and to speed up uh, the whole uh, deployment process. So if you look at a typical electronics product line, uh, you, you forget all the words underneath. There's a bunch of things that happen at what we call the front end of the line that make those green boards and insert a lot of components and uh, capacitors and resistors on them. It's a fascinating process. I recommend you take a look at it sometime. But as you get to the back end, as you start to insert more challenging components, so you're inserting the CPU, you're inserting the antenna, you're inserting the flexible connectors, you're inserting certain types of large, what we call through-hole components, these things are where automation doesn't exist in the factory. And this is where, in your beautiful Apple product line or Huawei network uh, connector, you find armies of people standing there doing those repetitive tasks over and over again. So how do we go about automating this bit of manufacturing, which is really not automated today? And we do that by combining what I would call, I, I used to call it stupid hardware, but I like to call it simple hardware. That is, we take these modular Lego up. Oh, that one went ahead a little bit. Let's go back. Uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Um, uh, one back. Can we go one back to the picture of the three cells, please? Um, yeah, thank you. So you, you, um, we have these modular blocks that can be assembled like Lego bricks, each with a certain type of function. One's a material handler, another's a conveyor. They're robotic cells dedicated for certain operations. And they're pretty straightforward in what they do, but you use AI-powered software now to tell them what to do and to watch them carry out the task and adjust on the fly. So I'm going to show you how we went about doing this with an example of a network board that we helped a customer automate. And I'm going to talk about two components that just narrow it down just for the sake of brevity. One is inserting what people call a heat sink and screwing it into place. And the second is a much higher value component called a DIM, dual uh, inline memory module, uh, that you insert into a particular socket. Now, normally when you're trying to automate things like this and you're given a robot, what you end up doing is tell the robot to go to a precise location. So most robots are actually relatively inflexible once they're programmed, right? They all go to X, Y, Z, do this rotation, press down, turn the screw eight times, and they'll do that thousands and millions of times a day. But give it a variation where the screw hole is not in the spot they expect it to be, it's not in that X, Y, Z coordinate, and the robots don't know what to do, they reject that part. What would a human do instead? A human would not go to a specific geometric location, a human would say, where is the hole? Let me put the screw in the hole. It sounds obvious that that would be a better approach to take. Yet today's automation, as I said, is not really automated to do those kinds of things. And so what we did was to use AI. And uh, what you watch here is a system by which we take a prototype board, take multiple photographs, and then combine it with geometric data, CAD data, and from that, start to extract features. So our system starts to recognize, like a human would, sockets, fixtures, holes. It starts to understand where things should go. Then the next step in the process is we have this concept we call recipes, which is 
instructions that are dynamically generated. So our system, because we focus on electronics, knows certain steps to begin with. It knows what a screw insertion sequence should look like or a dim insertion sequence should look like. And it applies that instruction set now to the features it has extracted. And furthermore, once we've done that, we can actually, in a digital environment, because we know the exact kinematics and physics of the arms that we're using to assemble, simulate that particular operation. And once we know it's safe and successful, we can literally say, I would like to say play, but you say run, and then it executes, and you're watching it. What it's doing is not going to a fixed geometric location. It's looking for that hole. In this case, that dim module is looking using an optical sensor for its socket, and then when it's inserting that DIM module, it's getting active feedback from a pressure sensor, just like a human hand would, to make sure it's not forcing things down too hard, right? That it doesn't break or it's pushing through with the right amount of force. This is a technique called reinforcement learning that is used to accomplish these things. So AI lets us crack one of these really difficult problems. You read in the press these days about how E-commerce operations are getting automated in terms of, you know, you can, the robot can find a banana, the robot can find a book and assemble it into the right package. This is the same approach, but we are applying it to a very, very um, precise set of operations of assembling high-value components into a network uh, communication device. Now, there's one more thing that is m really unique about this approach, and that is that once one of our systems learns how to recognize features, recognize a heat sink hole, recognize a dim socket, and develops a set of instructions on how to insert it, then all our systems everywhere in the world know how to do that. This is the same thing as if you think of an autonomous car, once one system has learned to recognize a tree, all self-driving systems based on that algorithm written to, uh, you know, they learn how to recognize a tree. Our system does the same, but for manufacturing operations. And that accelerates, simplifies the process of deploying automation, about giving it intelligence, about turning things that would have taken months. I mean, what I just showed you in a 30-second video, again, it might be hard for you to believe it, if you've not been on a factory floor, would take about six months worth of programming by a person to execute even one of those operations. And we're going to do it in less than like two days to, to try and get this thing working. So AI makes a tremendous difference in the ability for us to accelerate automation into factory floors. So that's one. So we're going after the place that is least automated, applying AI and automating assembly, inspection, testing, the back end of the line. But that same approach of teaching a production line, of configuring a production line, about responding to real-time information can be applied to the entire production line. So it can be applied to what we call the front end of the product line, where there are still individual machines. All those other machines I showed at the front, uh, uh, front end of the process are machines that are individually configured, individually managed, which means changes are hard to make. If you discover a quality issue, you have to go across 10 machines to make a change one at a time. And if you have eight production lines building that smart device, you have to now do it eight, 10 times eight. So it's really hard to make changes whether they come from a quality issue or they come from a customer uh, deciding that they need some kind of change made. So, using AI, you can turn data into intelligence. You ingest all the information, you watch all of the parameters, and like while these things look pretty and have nice colors, the real secret here is not just the visual presentation of the information, it's that it's watching for quality issues that are occurring on the line, and then figuring out, using AI, what the root cause might be at any given moment, and going back and suggesting corrective action. So this is what you call closed-loop manufacturing, and we're doing it in real time 
and improving production lines. Again, the simple way to understand this is you hear about self-driving cars. Cars watch an obstacle, they respond to it, and they keep going. This is effectively a self-driving production line. It is what we would say is the first step towards an autonomous production line, one that you basically have one person putting in materials at the end and one person at the other end collecting the finished product, but software running the entire system and dynamically configuring the system for success. And that's what AI lets us do, and this is what software-defined manufacturing truly enables. So what software-defined manufacturing is leading us to is a world where the production lines are increasingly autonomous and the factories are programmable. And that means flexibility in instructing the factory on what needs to be made can be done through software. Much like if any of you are in the software industry, today we deploy software on an ongoing, continuous basis, adapt to any changes, we find a bug, we fix it, then you just deploy instantly into the data center. We can start treating the making of physical goods in much the same way we have been approaching the making of digital goods, which is in an agile, iterative fashion. And this is what factories, not just of the future, but really increasingly of today, the cutting-edge factories are about. So in conclusion, software-defined manufacturing, enabled by AI, really leads to three things that you should remember. First one, which I've touched upon, is just adding intelligence to the factory. It's literally about adding eyes and brains to the muscles of ordinary machines. It makes those machines flexible, responsive, leads to higher yield, higher quality, and get, lets you get the results that you're looking for at the speed that you need it. It lets you amplify human abilities. This is not about replacing humans. It's about augmenting humans, that you're able to scale somebody's skills across multiple production lines. Intelligence is one. Two, all of that intelligence helps you change the economics of automation. So automation becomes more affordable, and so you can deploy it on more products in more locations around the world. You know, we've been in business less than a year. We've had about 20 major product brands use us in seven countries around the world, in Romania, in Mexico, in China, now in India. And everywhere there's, this kind of approach has been deployed, they've seen positive ROI, positive one of these manufacturing metrics that combine throughput and quality, just called OEE, overall equipment effectiveness, go up. And it's been a bit of a surprise that even in these low-cost labor countries, they're seeing higher ROI from automation than they expected. But there's real economic benefits to deploying automation, not the least of it is you can deploy it on more products, different types of products, and have a more agile way of making things. So that's the second benefit, intelligence and economics two benefits. But the one that I think is the longest term benefit that a more software defined approach to manufacturing will lead to, and that is innovation. Because as factories become more digital, two things happen. One, they become location agnostic. You can have smaller, nimbler, more distributed factories because you're no longer tied to, listen, it can only be in a low-cost labor location. You can locate it anywhere closer to your customer and have literally products built on demand in more sustainable, smaller factories. So you can have a more distributed way of making things. The second thing is as factories become more digital, they become more transparent. So you, you effectively start getting what you would think of as an API to the means of making. And manufacturing becomes less of a black art. I mean, most engineers, really, people who design and engineer things, are mystified by manufacturing. They, they don't really pay attention to how things are made because all of that feels like a black art. But as factories become more digital and more accessible, 
they can tap into that ability everywhere around the world and deploy their ideas. So the big dream of creating these digital factories, these software-powered, AI-powered factories, is really to enable anyone to make anything anywhere in the world. It is really to democratize innovation and make that manufacturing ability a superpower for the engineers in the world. And that is something I personally really look forward to. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Amar. And I'd like to invite yeah. you to take a seat and to invite our two other speakers, Alex and Theo, to join us for a panel where we're going to be discussing the future of manufacturing altogether. And we're very lucky today to have a real range of founders working on very different visions of the future at very different scale. So hopefully it'll be a really productive discussion. Uh, we're going to be together for about half an hour. We're going to have 10 minutes of questions at the end. And there will be a meet the speaker session afterwards. So I'll start by introducing myself. And then I'll hand over to the guys to introduce themselves. So my name is Karina Nami. And I'm a partner at a seed fund here in London called Episode One. And we love investing in deep tech businesses built by brilliant founders, of which Theo is an example. Um, and my background before that was I uh, built my own business applying AI to medical data. So I'd like to kick off with Alex to introduce himself. Hi, Karina. Hi. Nice to meet you. Um, so my name's Alex. I'm the CEO of a company called Metis Labs. Um, so I have a background in manufacturing. I worked for a decade or so in a range of different manufacturing facilities. And um, I think as Amar has, has well pointed out, a lot of these places are really left in the dark age. So what we do at Metis Labs is to address a specific um, problem that I kept encountering in factories. And that is one of large-scale equipment that you can't just simply replace. You're talking factories, you know, 10 stories high. They've been built decades ago, and they've been added to over the years. And the result is that you can't just press a button and get a product. Sure, they have a recipe they follow, but actually they rely upon experienced operators. So imagine someone who's been working there for 10 years who just knows how to fine-tune things just right. So I had that. I relied on a guy called Adrian, and then he didn't show up one day. Um, and that's the kind of problems that, uh, that our customers face. So we work with chemical companies, food, food manufacturers, um, anything making uh, large-scale commodity products. Brilliant. And Theo? Hi, everyone. I'm Theo, co-founder and CEO of CloudNC. And uh, we are working to halve the cost of manufacture for about $120 billion worth of components made on what are called CNC machines every year. Can we have that uh, video queued up, please? Uh, so, we have a video because otherwise it's going to be impossible to describe <laughs> what these things are or do. Uh, basically, this is a very powerful robot that uses spinning cutting tools to carve blocks of metal into useful shapes, where a useful shape might be a piece of aircraft or oil and gas equipment or the chassis of an iPhone or the body of a MacBook if you've got one of those. These machines are involved in the manufacture of virtually everything but today there is a very serious problem with them and that is that that was not automatic. A person had to sit in front of a computer for probably 40 hours telling that machine mm. everything about how it was going to produce that component. And this is a very serious problem for two reasons. Firstly, if I only want to make one of something, I can't amortize that human CAM programming cost over many units. A prototype is 10 times more expensive than it needs to be if you make it on a CNC machine. If, on the other hand, I want to make 10 or 100 or a million units, I run into problem number two which is that there are trillions of ways of producing a component with one of those machines, but only a few of them are fast. And it's just beyond the capability of the human mind to be able to find one of those truly optimal solutions. And this means that if you are making many units, virtually everything, in fact, that is being produced around the world today by these machines uh, is being made less than half as fast as it theoretically could be uh, with exactly the same equipment. So what we've been developing is software that solves both sides of those problems. It automates and it also optimizes. So you get components automatically, much cheaper prototypes, and very, very quickly, much cheaper mass production. 
We're now building full stack factories that leverage this software to produce metal components much faster and cheaper and better than has been possible before through full automation of everything from a uh, customer asking you for a quote and generating a price right the way through to dispatch. All of this should be lights out, it should be flexible, it should be completely automatic. Uh, it's very similar to what you guys are doing at Bright Machines, but for primary metal component manufacture mm -hmm. rather than assembly, you'll find these problems across the entire manufacturing industry everywhere you look. And uh, it's great to be on stage with other yeah. people trying to solve these sorts of problems. So what's the, uh, the most interesting object you have manufactured in your factory so far? Ooh, um, that's a tough one. Probably some pieces of Formula One car. Oh, very uh, cool. Often they don't tell you exactly what you're manufacturing, so you yeah. look at a component and go, oh, God, that's fascinating. I wonder what that goes in. And they say, no, <laughs> can't tell you. <laughs> Brilliant. Great. So I actually wanted to kick off with one of my favorite questions on panels. I think it's always best when people disagree with each other. So I'd love for each of you to tell us about a contrarian view that you hold about this industry, about the future of the industry, something that most people in the field would disagree with you about. And maybe we'll kick off over here. Something people would disagree with? Something yeah. people would disagree with you on. Yeah, I mean, I think the thing uh, I run in, we run into the most is people being skeptical that software can do any of the things that we've talked about. You know, it sounds like magic. You know, people just think of AI as a buzzword. They don't believe computer vision is advanced enough to do these kinds of things. And so, it, it, that, there's a manufacturing people are very, very pragmatic. They're very practiced in their art for, you know, I've done this 30 years, this is the only way to do it. So whether it's a simple thing, like I'd, we'd look at it and say, well, nobody would configure a server by going to, you know, uh, stand in front of a server and make configuration settings. You use software now to just deploy changes to servers, load balancers, any network device. Why couldn't you do that with your factory equipment? They look at us like, you know, we're come from Mars. Like, no, I have somebody walking the production floor What's wrong with doing this 80 times over? I mean, that's the, the skepticism is that software does anything at all in a factory. That's what I would say. And what's the most effective way you found to change the minds of those skeptics? Uh, two things. One, we show them uh, actual instances where it is working, so they can speak to one of our customers or visit a factory where it's actually in operation. And the second is, you know, we say, okay, try us. We'll do a pilot for you, and, uh, you know, proof is in the pudding. We'll prove it to you. Brilliant, yeah. How about you guys, any contrarian views? Ooh, probably that 3D printing is not the future. Oh yeah. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I actually come from additive manufacturers as a background. I used to work on developing metal 3D printing processes. And I really bought into the hype for a few years, but the more I learned about the industry, the more I decided that actual, there are fundamental physics-based limits on the process that mean that there are many things that you'll never be able to make effectively. I think the real future of manufacturing is not 3D printing, it is full automation of everything. It's automating all of the other types of equipment that right now 3D printing can compete against because they are not automated to set up. You've got to have a very highly skilled operator running these machines. They're impossible to reconfigure. Uh, that, to me, is the real future of manufacturing. I think 3D printing has a huge place in that, but mm -hmm. I don't think that it is the future in and of itself. Mm -hmm. Where do you think 3D printing will find its natural home? Uh, any application where the in-service savings from a component being lightweight or otherwise impossible to produce uh, will save you more money than how much it cost you to 3D print in the first place. So you're talking about bits of satellites or Formula One car where you can have these crazy hollow geometries. You just don't need that for 99.9% .9 of applications. But for those small number, you really do, and the use case is just perfect there. Yeah, brilliant. Thank you. So for me, I th I'd say most manufacturers don't actually know how they make stuff. Um, so Amar mentioned about the you know, dark knowledge, sort of dark art, it's everywhere. If you go into a factory, they usually have a process specification that defines how something is made. It's on the shelf, it's dusty, nobody looks at it. The real knowledge is held inside of the operator of Joe, who's worked there for 15 years, mm -hmm. uh, he's the guy. You can't capture that knowledge, it's inside of his head. Um, so everything you use every day is basically down to people like Joe who actually know how to make stuff. Yeah, and I know that there is a bit of a range here of, of a vision where you're going full stack, end to end, you're owning the whole process versus just taking on one part of that journey. So how have you guys thought about 
approaching your strategy, whether to just really specialize in one specific part of the chain or try and own it all the way through? I, I mean, I think it's, you have to keep both in mind. I think the whole process is what you want to get to over time, but to sort of the, where the industry is, you have to find the place where the pain is the greatest and start the adoption process that leads to that future. So I think it's a little bit of trying to keep the North Star that you're trying to get to in focus, but start with a practical problem that gets that process towards the future started. I mean, somebody once said, before you go on Mars, you have to land the rocket on the barge, right? You've got to yeah. take one step at a time. So, you yeah. know, that's, that's the way we think yeah, about it. Yeah, and I have to say, as, as an investor, it's always best when we're presented with a pitch that explains that North Star, yeah. shows us how there is this first step right. that's addressing a truly painful point mm -hmm. in the process where there's going to be demand and uptake first. Exactly. But it, it carves a path to that much bigger vision. How about you guys? Uh, I think for us it was uh, necessary more than a choice. Uh, in order to develop technology like this, uh, it would we could develop it to be handed out to all other factories around the world, but that would require years more effort to support the enormous variation of like thousands of different machines in people's workshops and ways they use them and all of the different tools they have. If you control every aspect of the process yourself, not only does it make it a bit easier to develop the technology, but then you can also optimize it far, far further by building your process around the software as a single unit. Uh, that is, I think, what you need to do in order to achieve true full automation. Otherwise, it's just too complicated. Yeah, taking a random noise like other human beings who don't understand your systems out of the process and just trying to own it all the way through. Yeah, you do. Uh, there's also huge opportunities to automate all of the other aspects of the process. So you don't really just want to automate you know, the robotic assembly machine uh, as you're doing at Freight Machines. You want to <coughs> automate everything that goes around mm -hmm. them, the, uh, Ballot the, feeders and all, yeah. Yeah, the scheduling, the quality, everything into one unit. So end to end, you can run lights out, or if not lights out, extremely highly optimized. Yeah, brilliant. So we work with a different classification of manufacturers. Uh, these guys are, I would say, operate more in the what's classic called like high value manufacturing, electronics, um, discrete manufacturing industries. We work more with process industries, and in that sector, uh, you're dealing with, as I say, very large scale equipment that cannot um, economically be replaced. So what we're dealing with is helping them to run that equipment more effectively. Uh, now every factory is different, so the way we approach the market is positioning ourselves as an application that's agnostic of other software platforms. So you know you hear of IoT platforms, industrial IoT platforms made by the likes of GE, Siemens, etc. We we're an application that sits on top of that and learns how uh, one of these large-scale factories work. Those large-scale factories, they're not going to be replaced anytime soon, the ch so the challenge is to get them working in a robust, reliable, and efficient manner. So on to another point where I know you guys are going to disagree. <laughs> Building a manufacturing business of the future in the UK, or at least in Europe, versus the US. Tell me, uh, tell me how you feel about that. Uh, I can't speak to building a manufacturing business in the US because I've never done it. Uh, I can speak about the UK and I think that the UK is a fantastic place to build any kind of disruptive <coughs> manufacturing startup because you've got all of the pieces. You've got incredible software engineering talent. You have a vibrant funding system. You have government support through grants and the manufacturing research centers and the catapults uh, and you have that investments and support ecosystem through the startup accelerators right the way through to series B and C. At some point you do need to go over to the US, firstly for the size of the market. The UK market size is limited, so it's great to start here, but it's not great to stay here. You need to expand out. And the same thing will happen when you need to start raising the really big financing rounds. Your 50 to 100 million pound rounds, you're going to have to go international for that kind of thing as well. Whereas in the US, I imagine all of these things exist. So I think the UK is great. Perhaps the US is a little bit better, but <laughs> I couldn't say. Perhaps Omar has thoughts. Yeah. I mean, if I might, I mean, I think the, I'm not an expert on the UK market, although we've sold uh, products here for uh, many years. I, I would say that for a young company, you need three things. You need access to capital, you need access to talent, and you need risk tolerant customers, somebody who's willing to try a solution for the first time. And I think, you know, look, I think um, access, to access to capital has gotten better around the world, although 
you still have a lot of people willing to write very big checks in the United States. Talent is, I think, right now, the smart people everywhere. I don't think any particular country has any particular advantage in, in talent. And, uh, I think there's smart people everywhere, so I, I don't think the U.S. has an edge over the U.K. or any other part of the world. I think the third one, the access to customers, people willing to take a chance on you, mm -hmm. that's the one place where, at least in my experience, it's been easier to get U.S. companies to try a new technology than it has been Asian or European customers. It's just a little bit, and, and maybe I, I, my information or my experience is a bit dated, but I think you know many Silicon Valley companies, networking companies or mobile phone companies were startups themselves once upon a time, and they're kind of comfortable with that history, and they're willing, if they see a promising technology, to use it as a competitive advantage to launch themselves first. Um, so I think there, that's one place I feel the ethos is a little different between the European and the US side. But I could so be so I've bridged the gap a little bit. I've worked for five years in, in yeah. manufacturing in the US, in California, um, and now so for five years here in the UK. Um, I think that I would agree absolutely with you, Theo. I think as a startup, this is a great environment to build a company. Um, but I think the thing that's really missing here in the UK is that third part that you've mentioned, Amar, mm. um, you know, risk-tolerant customers. So we're a UK-based company, but actually all of our, all of our customers are in Europe. Um, that's not by design. That's by, uh, I would say, by uh, really the speed of the market. We've found the UK to be uh, interested in new technologies, but not hungry for new technology, not hungry for an advantage. And I think that comes... For any of you guys who, who come from the UK background, um, you know, we have a long legacy in trying to get out of manufacturing. And I think a lot of the manufacturers uh, that are left here in the UK, that has affected their outlook. Um, so certainly working over in the US, the, the tolerance for uh, and the appetite for trying to get a competitive advantage and, and the opportunity uh, is much bigger. So there's a, a mindset of opportunity as opposed to a mindset of um, scarcity, I would say. Yeah, I must say, from a financing perspective, so when I first tried to raise money for my business in 2012, we were applying machine learning techniques to genetic data. It was very edgy. And in the UK, there just wasn't the risk capital for it. There was in the US. But now, I think those types of ideas, there's absolutely risk funding mm -hmm. for it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things are mm -hmm. changing in some aspects, but it's interesting to hear that on the mm -hmm. customer side of things, it's still, there's a different risk appetite. So just to change gears a little bit, you guys are all at very different stages. So tell us how many employees you each have. We have six. Six. We have 60. 60. 450. OK, so quite a range. <coughs> so I'd be really interested to hear, especially for the entrepreneurs in the audience who are building businesses in this space, some of the lessons you've learned on the more operational side of building your business, the different stages that you're at, the stages you've gone through to get to where you are. I'd love to invite you to share any thoughts on on building businesses in this space. You want to start with? Well, my journey is shorter than yours so far <laughs> as the youngest, <laughs> smallest company on stage. Um, I think, so coming back to getting funding and getting a startup off the ground, an industrial startup, five years ago or so, I tried to innovate. In, I worked for a large uh, company, G, uh, GKN, large um, global aerospace automotive company. And I, we tried to innovate. I started an innovation program for this company and really tried to, to get that innovation throughout the company. Um, and I was skeptical that there would be support for manufacturing startups. Uh, so I think we've, got, we've come into a phase now where um, investors and sort of employees as well are really opening their mind to what's possible in this sector. It's absolutely huge. This is really one of the biggest sectors in the world. Um, so I think it's really coming into a very interesting stage. And five years ago, if you'd said any of us could start a manufacturing startup and do any of the things we're doing, I don't think I would have believed it. But now it seems very credible, and, and there's a lot of companies uh, like us really coming up. Uh, coming up. Hmm. I think the, uh, the most important lesson that I've learned would be that when you are, when you're building a startup, 
to deliver a product to the market. You're not really building a product, you're building a company designed to deliver that product. And so uh, I think that something we did quite well was we brought in talent and HR incredibly early. We started building out our recruitment function at only 10 people so that we would have a growth engine to bring in the best talent and keep them as happy as possible and keep them as effective as possible as we scaled up in the very difficult journey from 10 to 50 people. Uh, one to 15 people is pretty easy. 15 to 50, everything breaks. And it's really helpful to have people on that journey with you who know how to build in layers of management, build in training, build in all of the ways of working that you need as you scale up from just a bunch of people sitting in a room where everyone can talk to each other to multiple sites, perhaps multiple geographies, people who don't even know everybody else in the company anymore. Uh, yeah, so work on working on building your company to be as effective as possible to solve the problem, that must not be forgotten, because uh, it's very tempting to just focus on your product and forget that you've actually got an entire company to build around that product. Yeah. Um, so what I would say is that as your company grows up, uh, in a good way and in a challenging way, your ability to experiment goes down. So. When you start a company, you have less degrees of freedom. <clears throat> You're trying to experiment your way to an answer, whether that is product market fit or business model or what kind of people you need. You know, In the beginning, you're trying to do a lot of, I won't call it trial and error, but it's a little bit more of a hypothesis. You try it out, you adjust, and you're, you're sort of trying to find the pattern. Once you find the pattern, building a company is all about repeating and scaling that pattern. And so you stop trying to do too many things and you double down on the things that are working. And in a, in a way that kind of, uh, it, it constrains you in a, in a good way because you're not flailing all over the place. But it's, you know, it, you someday look back wistfully, hey, you remember the time when you and I could scratch something on a whiteboard and there it was out in the product the next day. You stop being, a, you stop doing those kinds of things. So. And, and that's actually a good thing because what it, the market has taught you through that process is what's the most valuable thing that you're doing, what are the ways in which they will pay you for it. And so I think growing up as a company is a lot about going away from a totally experimental way of look, looking at things, finding the pattern and repeating and scaling the pattern. And then a lot of what you do as a company adjusts around that some of the team that you started with may not be the team you end with. There are more people, like Theo said, that are managers. You may not have the person that was the, I, I coded myself overnight. You know, and, and then I think uh, the one sustaining thing you need throughout that process is what, you call, what people call culture, uh, which is the ability to never forget what the whole company is all about. And that's the one thing that you try and preserve as you grow up. But a lot of things then actually, in some ways, simplify and focus as you grow from 60 to 450. So, so I'm going to wrap up with one final question to put each of you on the spot. Could you name a business in this space that you really admire? So another company that you wish you had started, you would love to invest in, who you think is doing something super interesting in the space. Theo, let's kick off with you. I need a minute to think. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's all about putting you on the spot, Alex. Oh yeah, I can answer straight away. I'd say Cloud NC. I think um, so. I first met Theo when you were really just getting the, the uh, business just off the ground, um, and I think the approach of uh, working in this space, CNC manufacture, that I'm very familiar with, uh, and going for the full stack approach, is very smart. Uh, so I think you guys have a bright future ahead. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Alex. Nice. Little panel loving going on here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll, go, I'll go next. I mean, they're not exactly a manufacturing software company, but I admire what Amazon is doing. Amazon, I think you, they get into every space. I think before long, you'll see them doing, building products on demand so that when you order something, an Amazon uh, device, an Alexa or something like that, it would not surprise me at all that they will not have inventory, they will not have anything in place, but they will build it on demand and customize it and ship it to you. And I think those guys have this one thing that I really admire, which is they have a relentless focus on removing friction in the system. The whole story you hear about Amazon, why they have Alexa today, is not because they got enamored of voice or AI. It was because they said, 
the fact that somebody has to click a mouse is one more step in the process. It's why they invented Prime, it's why they've got Alexa, it's why they do all these things that they do, and you and I now enjoy the benefits of everything that they do, and I think you know, when they come to manufacturing, they're going to do something very, very similar and uh, take away the friction in the system, and you're just going to look at it and say, why aren't all products built this way? You know, I think I, 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 that's the company I admire mm -hmm. in many ways. Had a chance to think? Yeah, I think there's, uh, there's two. First one being Amazon for many of the reasons that you describe. Uh, the second one being SpaceX. Not so much for the mm. vision, but for their utter willingness to tackle what, when they started, was a literally impossible problem. Yeah. I know, let's go and compete with United Launch Alliance at the thing that they do best, and we have no idea how to build rockets, but sod it, let's figure it out, and let's start off by trying to buy nuclear missiles off the yeah. Russians, because why not? Uh, that kind of just relentless disregard for the utterly impossible is something that I really admire in another company and that's something that we try and instill in ours as well. Good. Brilliant. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. If you want to speak to the, to the panelists, then please follow that paddle over there. But join me in thanking our panelists today for thank you. Cheers. Thanks very much. And I'd like to um, invite up for a very quick palate cleanser, I've been told, Jen Hirsch, who's going to entertain you for just a short five-minute session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, clicker. Where's the clicker? <laughs> Thank you. Hello. All right, those of you who get to stay, you'll get a reading list, you'll get some tech trend spotting things, and thank you for listening for the next few minutes. So I should have known I would have ended up as a futurist. I've got a much longer title, but it takes too long to say. Um, when in instead of misbehaving in the classroom, I would take sci-fi books and read them underneath the desk. And as many of you, if you love sci-fi, you probably are as in love with Dune as I am. And what I love about Dune explicitly is there a moment where the protagonist, Jessica, must ingest a lethal poison and transmute it into something beneficial, not only to save her life, but the life of the unborn children. And that's really what science fiction does. It takes things that are dangerous, poisonous, and potentially future-threatening, and transmutes them into something palatable that we can grapple with and play around with. So, whoop, what's more dangerous than a talk about sex, tech, and work? So, with that, um, stories fundamentally are the only way we can hack human software. We are limited in our firmware and our hardware, it takes generations for things to change, and while we may augment them with tools, it's really how we hack our cognitive ability, how we play with our imagination that really updates us. So, why science fiction explicitly? It's my work use science fiction as yet another tool to think about if there is a precedent set. Have we imagined a future where this is the case? Have we figured out the plausibility? As I Isaac Asimov conjectured in his DARPA things, one of our goals is to think about, is the future possible? And in what ways can we recombine things and reimagine things for that to be true? Science fiction also reminds us of what makes us human. Writers are empathy engines. They think about where we go with our future, but holding on to our humanity, both the best and the worst of it. It also, even in today's fast-paced society, continues to hold our attention and seep into our conscious to inform future generations. If Elon Musk, as referenced earlier, often cites science fiction as one of the reasons he's built some of his moonshot products. So what about work? So science fiction holds three constants for work. It must allow us to come together. We always want to transcend space and time because we are so cognizant of the limitations in our physical bodies. And fundamentally, it's about creativity and productivity. So the example I'd like to cite here is uh, Cory Doctorow's uh, Walk Away, made in 2017, if you're not familiar with it. In it, he conjectures that the 1% have moved on to become zillionaires, shorthand zadas. And the only opportunity for those to work, because there's no hope of future advancement, is to quote unquote, walk away. And these societies spring up where people are using their creativity and productivity to create self-powered communities. They come together in agreed upon fashions, 
configured and reconfigured over time. And they are thinking about the big goal they're trying to say is, how do we transcend this world that we've created? What would utopia look like that allows us to transcend space and time? And I want to say that today, more than ever, the creativity and productivity is a choice. That's one of the worlds that tech enables. And my favorite example is this. So for those of you older in the room, on the left we have the 1980s Far Side comic in which hopeful parents look at their video addicted child and think, could he one day be employed? And fast forward 30 years later, on the right, you have the top Twitch player. Now people tune in around the world, enabled by multiple tech platforms, earning $5.4 million, which is a 100x increase over the 1980s adjusted salary. So on to sex. Now, the internet can tell us lots about sex and sci-fi, but I'm going to keep it on the literary moment. So, 1969, The Left Hand of Darkness, Ursula Le Guin. Ursula Le Guin posits that gender is not binary. We can phase between the two. It's a choice. It's a choice based on context. It's a choice based on partnership. It is up to us. Science fiction is kind of one of the harbingers of gender being a false binary conundrum. Now, that's picked up in 1985 to 1987 through the Lilith Brood series. The Lilith Brood series says that there's a third sex, an androgynous sex, and this is truly the creative force. Now, what that means is we're driven to creation. We're driven to procreation. Across what means we're playing more and more with today, we're not limited so much anymore by our physicality, and we can imagine worlds that are different. And finally, the 1985 book now reimagined as the Hulu series, The Handmaid's Tale. Handmaid's Tale then does say that our bodies are paramount, and consent is the ingredient to a functional society, and yet we somehow forget this. Now, tech and science fiction, okay, there's probably going to be a lot said today about there. But fundamentally, tech is a tool. We become what we behold, we shape our tools, and thereafter our tools shape us. So I like to go to the current example of the Lightless series by C.A. Higgins, Contemporary Trilogy. Um, in it, a best-in-class ship is given a AI consciousness in the heart of a black hole. Now, if there's not an analogy for corporations, I don't know what there is. Um, or even that the responsibility of the creator then becomes how does this tool interact? Does it level planets? At what point does it have? And I think we're seeing more and more we're responsible for shaping the way that the tools will. They cannot just in there unattended. We have the responsibilities as a creator to teach and educate not only the tools themselves, but the broader use of them. Now, one of the best things that science fiction does is world building. World building then imagines a case that tech is pervasive, that tech is adoptive, and tech is adopted and creates worlds and functions. This is critical because oftentimes, without observation, tech is invisible. It's accepted. And writers then call it out, build those worlds to have us look at it, to question it, to think about how did we get here and is this okay? And what I love about science fiction is we see technology and trends come and go. It's a big wave. It starts, crests, falls, only to be reimagined again. And in my work, I'm always looking for this to happen at least three times before I think that a technology or a trend is going to catch hold. But sci-fi tends to weather these trends. It remains relevant throughout all of them. It gives us something to hold on to for the reasons that we said earlier. It tells us why we're human. It tells us the world at which we exist and teaches us about what really means. But Jen, what about my favorite dystopian future? Because, you know, we might live in one today. We play with these dystopian fixtures to think about what happens when our tools leave us, what happens when the things we know, those invisible hierarchies fall apart, the tech tools fall apart. But as with all creation, it's fundamentally on us to imagine a kinder, gentler future. My favorite recent dystopian is a wonderful art collection and manga novel called The Jelly Civilization. Um, highly recommend it to anyone who's a sci-fi nerd. Uh, in it, a young woman, Disillusion, creates jelly that eats just about everything, but then this jelly comes on to give food, life, clothing, and even bring our ancestors to life so we can commune with them and benefit from their knowledge. So with that, I want to thank you for your quick attention and remind you of a quick tech trend checklist using your sci-fi. Is there human interest? 
What part of the cycle or the wave are we? And is there a creative precedent for this to happen? And you can always at me, sci-fi, or other tech trends at Jennifer J. Hirsch, or find me on LinkedIn. Thank you.